Friends, if you've been with us on this journey since the very beginning, way back in July of 2009, you know that it wasn't until September of 2015 that we first started featuring BMWs on a regular basis here on the old show. It was with the then new G12 750 from Monticello Motor Club. So anything that came before it in the way of a Mini or a BMW, we never had the opportunity to share with you. Yes, we did feature Rolls Royces in that period, but not BMWs and Minis. So we missed opportunities like this, the i3, when it came out, what, about a year, year and a half prior to the G12, in that A, it was a totally new car for BMW, but B, more importantly, it was a totally new propulsion system, and C, I would think the biggest reason why this is interesting, at least to me, is the manufacturing and the ethos that goes behind it. Now, the realities of our business, uh, if we miss an opportunity, uh, we either can't look at that car because we just don't have the time just running around looking at all the other new car introductions, or there's just the realities of the ROI of looking at a car that came out three years ago. It just doesn't make prudent business sense for us. So we've waited for this opportunity, which is an update to the i3, specifically a bigger battery. We'll look at that, but first, I think we should look underneath here to understand really how different this is from its segment. And uh, it would stand to reason you would think there's an electric motor underneath here, but there isn't, especially if you pull up these little screens here. There's no electric motor. You see like the subframe underneath there. You see all the steering componentry. And yes, you do see a very small frunk. Just from this perspective, this wouldn't be the best Costco hauler, I would say, but at least you got something up here. But this really just tells you that there's something very different about the i3, something you and I need to unpack. So riddle me this, what does that stunning Porsche 991.2 Carrera 4S that still leaves me weak in the knees have in common with this very oddly shaped BMW electric car. If you were to say that in both cases, there is no way on God's green earth to see the engine, or in this case, the electric motor, even if you were to pull out this panel and this cover to the dipstick for the range extender, you would be correct. Now, this is where things really start to get different with the i3. Number one, the electric motor is placed in the rear. So kind of like that 911. Uh, it drives the rear wheels, unlike the Carrera Forest version of that 911, uh, but it's 170 horsepower, 184 pound-feet of torque. And what's interesting about that is it comes in at zero. That's what we like about electric cars. Now let's put that aside. The big change here for this latest model is the battery. So previously there was a 22 kilowatt battery on offer. And I don't want to just say previously because that's somewhat misleading. That 22 kilowatt battery is still on offer and that's good for 81 miles of range. So says the US EPA, all those people. The high commissioner people in Europe, they come up with a different number. Now this one is fitted with a larger battery. It's 50% bigger, 33 kilowatts. This one is good for 114 miles of range. Again, Europe comes up with a different number. Now this one you're looking at, uh, this is the most loaded to the gills i3 that is on offer. Uh, it is called like a pterodactyl version. I forgot the name. They come up with these really cutesy names because they know hipsters are going to buy or lease these things. You shouldn't be leasing cars. Uh, so this one is fitted also with a range extender. Now the range extender is a two-cylinder 647cc. It's effectively a motorcycle engine. It comes from a large BMW scooter, the C650 GT, which is $10,000 for the actual whole scooter but they give you a $6,000 discount to have just the motor fitted to this vehicle. And with the range extender, it adds an additional 83 miles of range in this latest one, 78 in the previous. Now this is, I know there was a lot of debate when we first looked at the Volt way back in the day that the range extender in that wasn't connected to uh, the drive wheels. Well, we then found out in certain cases it is connected to the drive wheels. In this case, it's not at all connected to the drive wheels. All the range extender does is it keeps the battery up to about 30% charge to keep the car going. And it's not designed for long distances. It's designed just to get you to a point where you can recharge the vehicle. Now let's put all of that aside and move to the captain obvious question here. And that is the overall efficiency. And that's rated an MPGE. The previous model, which is a total battery electric vehicle, no range extender, 
Uh, that was 124 MPGE. Used to be the best one out there until we looked at that Hyundai Ioniq. That's now 136 MPG, and that's like the, the king of MPGE, at least in the US. But this one is the range extender model. And technically, yes, it is a BEV, but they call it an REX in like government speak. So I don't know what it is. It seems like this, this, this dinosaur theme is going on. It's a pterodactyl, but it's also a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, maybe they're trying to get more parents to buy these things. I think that's the case. Anyway, in this uh, range extended model, it's lower MPGE because the weight goes up, so it's 118 MPGE. But now let's put that aside, and there's still one more thing that's tied to that range extender, and that is the gas tank. Because obviously, if you're going to have two cylinders, you're going to need some sort of gas tank. It's a very small gas tank. Previously, it was 1.9 gallons. Uh, but now it's 2.4. But technically, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's like Sweet Card Monty. They're just moving things around here. The gas tank previously was really 2.4 gallons, but BMW, they locked off a half a gallon, made it 1.9, because they didn't want the gasoline range to exceed the electric range. Thus, it wouldn't qualify in California for all the things that make it interesting in California. Okay, I think that's everything here. Now we need to move on to driving dynamics. Again, like that 991 .2 Targa, we need to unpack the name, rank, and serial number of driving dynamics before we press on to the exotic stuff. We already discussed at the top of the episode that it's a McPherson struts up here. In the rear, it's a multi-link. After all, it is a BMW. The wheels, this is where things get a bit interesting. Remember, this is the most loaded to the gills i3 one can have. So this is what the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex pterodactyl model, which means it's fitted with 20-inch wheels. The basic, the 22-kilowatt battery vehicle, it's 19-inch wheels fitted as standard. The brakes, they are regen, uh, and all the way around, they're 11-inch diameter rotors. Then there are the dimensions, and that's where things get very interesting here. So uh, let's start with the width. It's 70 inches wide, 157 inches long, but most importantly, the wheelbase. It is a 101-inch wheelbase. As a basis of comparison, the Alpina B7 that we had sitting in this very spot had a 126.4-inch wheelbase so over two feet longer than this one. And that is going to play a huge role in our full first drive review, so make sure you come back for that. Okay, now that we've got all that out of the way, let's talk exotic materials. Uh, the first thing is a party trick, and that is the cool doors here. Love me some of these suicide doors. But more importantly, look down here. This looks like carbon fiber. It looks like the entire structure is carbon fiber. Even back here when you open up the hatch, you see the same exposed carbon fiber. But technically, it is not carbon fiber. It's carbon fiber reinforced polymer. And this is where things get interesting, at least for me, with this vehicle. Uh, this is a product, or at least a portion of it, from BMW's own facility in Lake Moses, Washington, or would you call that Lake Moisha, Washington? Yeah, think of that as a bonus question. Put that in the comments below. Uh, they constructed their own facility up there for a number of reasons. They know they were doing a vehicle like this, the i8, which we'll have on the show coming up after this, uh, and other vehicles to come. And the logic was they want to be able to build their own carbon fiber or carbon fiber reinforced polymer, which is effectively plastics that's reinforced with carbon fiber for strength and lightness. And the idea is to lower the overall mass. But being that they wanted to really invest heavily, they wanted their own facility. So they get the raw materials from Japan. It's then uh, manufactured into this raw material of this carbon fiber reinforced polymer in Lake Moisha, Washington. And then that is sent to, what, 50 miles north of Munich. And then they make it into these structure pieces to lower the mass of like an I-3 or an I-8. And then that in turn is sent to Leipzig to make an I-3. Now, if you don't think that's cool, you're definitely not paying attention. And that is not the only exotic materials here, but for that, we need to go to the inside. So, the interior. It's high-tech, but it's definitely not as high-tech as your own carbon fiber factory, specifically placed in the high desert of Washington State to take advantage of abundant yet inexpensive hydroelectric energy. 
No, this is high tech for the sake of we're going to slap you across the face. Actually, no, not slap you, punch you across the face to make sure you know it's high tech in here. Now, the first thing we got to focus on is the textures. You and I have debated on this for a long time and pretty hard recently. Like in the CTS, it came out, what, in 2014? Too many textures on the door. Then you and I just argued about the Navigator. Way too many textures going on in there. And the reason why that doesn't work, uh, as opposed to, say, the Volvo XC60, is because the textures in the Navigator are low quality, where the Volvo, they're high quality. Here, let's just count. On that door panel, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Six different textures. Now, I would say that's way too many textures going on in one small space in the interior of a small car. But really, you gotta look at the ethos, what's going on here. BMW designers, especially the color and trim people, are not just putting all those things there to make you just get dizzy. They're putting them there to reinforce where the textures come from. Like for example, there's some cloth there, there's some leather, and there's even some hemp. Not exactly my cup of tea, but there's some hemp in that door panel. Now, we talked about the, the, the different dinosaur names, but in, in reality, what they're called is there's a Deca, there's a Mega, then there's a Giga Trim, and then there's the Terra, which this is. Now, when you have the Terra, that's when it's full leather. Uh, it changes the wood. Now, one thing that BMW went out of their way back in 2014 to point out was the wood in all of the i3s was eucalyptus that came from sustainable forests somewhere in Europe. This one is more of a luxury model, so this is like standard BMW wood, and it's full leather even onto the dashboard and the door panels. And you really can't see it here, but these are brown seats. You really got to see it in like just super strong daylight to see that these are brown. Odd choice with a black car. Then, uh, for the first time, this is fitted with a moonroof, but I wouldn't call this a moonroof. I'd call this... Uh, portholes because you've got this, I think what is a structure piece here so this is literally a, I feel like I'm 20,000 leagues under the sea but I still like the fact that there's a sunroof in there uh, the rest of it some of the design choices some work like I, I'm starting to like this setup of the dashboard and having this huge expanse here it definitely grows on you like very strong term I'd say it's more funky to the point where I, I probably could daily something like this not a huge fan of this uh, steering wheel because it looks like it came out of like a New York City LTD Crown Vic taxi. Uh, the rest of it, again, I can't overemphasize. Super high quality textures. This one, once again, lot every option, including the Harman Kardon sound system, which kind of kicks. Okay, I think that's everything on the inside. Now, I don't think anybody would be particularly shocked to find out that most people buy these things either to skate certain tax laws or more likely to get into an HOV lane like in the US. Uh, that brings up an important point here. The first one of these when they came out, the, the Range Extended Model in 2014, it was the first car that the state of California blessed with a BEVX designation so it too could qualify for the green sticker to get into the HOV lane. Uh, then there is a white sticker, that's the full EV, so the BEV model, which is no range extender. But really, there's an important thing we still have to get to, and that is the weight. There is an extra battery, and everyone had an extra battery, a bigger battery, 50% bigger. It adds about 100 pounds, so the weight, depending on what scale and what country you're looking at, is 2,961 pounds all the way up to 3,234. So there is some credence to this fact that they've used all this carbon fiber reinforced polymer to lower the overall mass. Now we're going to spend some more time talking about this in a rather unique first drive review so make sure you come back for that. But in the interim I want to leave you guys with a question. And the question is not anything about the tech, the propulsion system, that carbon fiber or any of that stuff. It's about the design. What do you think of this design? Do you like it or do you not like it? And let me know why or why not. Let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with two things. Number one, make sure you download our fancy updated application and click subscribe and notifications on YouTube. And number two, a fun fact. So you guys know I moved about eight months ago. 
And there are some good car guys in my neighborhood specifically, right on my street. And my next door neighbor, he's got like a, a M4 convertible in a very cool color. He's got a bunch of old muscle cars, some good stuff. But his wife, she drives this and she goes on and on about how much she loves this thing. So I spent some time talking to her about it. And it turns out she went from a Mercedes Benz station wagon that she had for 13 years to this, yet she loves this more. Until I see you next time, Bish Beta.